Okay, hi everyone, my name is Matthew Hunt. I'm the staff microscopist here at the KNI, and today we'll be covering gallium-focused IMB microscopy. And for this one, I thought we'd start off by showing some videos to show what we're trying to build towards. All these things we're about to learn and understand, we want to see them in action first so that we know what we're, we're building towards. So this first one is platinum deposition. So maybe when you think of gallium-focused ion beam, you think of directly etching materials to create devices or other features. Uh, we, can also, uh, we can also deposit material. So I'll show how with a platinum precursor gas, if we scan a gallium-focused ion beam and say a circle, we can get deposition of platinum in the shape of that circle uh, quite immediately. This is all done in real time, and I'm imaging this with a scanning electron microscope. So this is about, I think, six microns in diameter. So we have now a pad of platinum. And if I go to the next slide here and run this video, I'll show how we can etch into that platinum the old KNI logo. So this is something I did several years ago. And we're using a bitmap to do this, and we're etching differently based on the gray scales in the, in the bitmap. So white pixels etch deeper, and dark pixels don't etch quite as deep. So you can do 3D milling in this way. And then on this slide, I'll show what happens if we flow xenon difluoride gas while we then scan the whole field of view with the gallium-focused ion beam. So this one takes a few seconds to get going, but we're basically flowing in this xenon, xenon difluoride, and then this is an ion beam image. So we're, we're both getting signal, secondary electron signal, so we can see what's happening, and the gallium is interacting with the sample and the xenon and in a couple seconds, we'll start to see things really start to open up. So this has already, we already have some gallium in that field of view from the last step. So that gets attacked most quickly and gets attacked first. And then it just starts to uh, attack everywhere else. So xenon difluoride is a way for us to, uh, to increase the etch rate with gallium-focused ion beam. Uh, this is what one of those gas injection system needles look like. Uh, and Here's my little pillar that I was making. It's very directional, we'll talk about that. So you can kind of rotate it back and forth and make a little device like this. Not very functional, but this is a, an example of using, of depositing platinum, doing etching directly with a bitmap, and then etching with xenon difluoride. Okay, so now getting into the, the beginning part of the, the, the lecture in terms of explanations, I wanna point out that all of the resources for gallium-focused ion beam, including this lecture, the, the slide notes uh, are available on our YouTube page, so lab.kni.caltech.edu. And this is a slide just to show the functionality that we have across all of our uh, scanning electron microscopes and focused ion beams in the KNI. and uh, These are all things that I'm going over through these three lectures. We did SEM last week. We'll do helium and neon-focused ion beam next week. And today, of course, gallium. These are the three books that I recommend for the three different types of microscopy. So if you want to further investigate any of these concepts, I would point you towards these books. And as I said in the SEM lecture, what I try to do with these is draw analogies across the different platforms. So here with the emission sources, we see that each one has a tungsten needle and there's gonna be uh, an extraction electrode, there's going to be uh, usually a suppressor, and really what's different is the type of species that we're form forming a beam out of, but a lot of the construction of the sources can fundamentally be understood in a similar way. And the column optics are also fairly similar. We talked about electromagnetic lenses with SEM last week, Today we'll talk about electrostatic lenses that are used with the gallium-focused ion beam. Um, so I'm calling electrostatic lenses I'm showing with this shape. These are electromagnetic lenses. Uh, and this is our helium-neon uh, column for next week. You can see they're quite similar. The only thing that's really different today is that in the gallium-focused ion beam, we don't have quadrupoles in the column that are uh, the steering optics. Uh, so before we get into the real physical concepts, I just, I'll show some pictures of the microscopes themselves. Uh, this is a gallium and SC, gallium fib and SEM dual beam system. So SEM on the main optical axis, gallium fib offset by 52 degrees. Here's a vacuum screen associated with the system where we 
see the ion getter pumps that pump on the columns, the turbo molecular pump that pumps on the chamber. We can look at this system from different angles. Here we get a good look at the gallium focused ion beam and some of the gas injection systems you already saw for xenon difluoride. Uh, we'll also talk about the omniprobe manipulator. This is a way for us to uh, extract material from the bulk of our sample if, for instance, we want to create a TEM lamella sample. If we look inside the chamber, here is our six inch stage on our Nova 600 and it's XYZ rotation and tilt. If we look at the column here, here's your SEM column and in reverse view we have our gallium fib column here and this is what the gas injection needle or gas injection system needles look like. They then insert close to the sample from, from these positions. And then this is our omniprobe needle which is kind of tucked up inside the chamber that will also insert down and can ultimately make contact with our sample. Uh, this is another dual beam system that we have, the Nova 200. This one's equipped with energy dispersive spectroscopy, wavelength dispersive spectroscopy for uh, elemental composition analysis. And then I'll talk a lot about this next week with helium and neon uh, focused ion beam, but this also has a gallium column on it just like we saw with the SEM dual beam system. And inside of our, of our helium neon gallium system we have uh, similar construction detectors and uh, here's your gallium fib behind the, the column for helium and neon. All right, I, I showed this last week. We have electromagnetic lenses and we have electrostatic lenses. So the electromagnetic are for electrons uh, we talked about how you have a, a coil of wires, so you run current through that coil, you generate a magnetic field, you allow it to leak out into the column. Think of this as radially symmetric. And so off-axis electrons get more strongly bent back towards the middle of the column. On-axis electrons get less strongly bent, and the idea is we get them all to come to a crossover point or a focus point. In an electrostatic lens, this is an Einzel lens, so these are three parallel plates. The middle plate held at positive potential relative to the top and bottom, held at ground potential, and we're able to create these electric field lines. And the idea here is that we symmetrically accelerate and decelerate the ion beam as it passes through the lens. So we don't change the energy of an electron going through a magnetic field. We would change the energy of an ion going through an electric field. And so we need to symmetrically accelerate, decelerate, so it emerges from the lens with the same energy that it had going in. Uh, but the idea is the same, is that we bring all these ions to a crossover or a focal point at the other side of the lens. Okay, now here's the bottom of our column. We talked about how our objective lens is, again, that wire coil at the bottom of this column. If we turn it on, we're able to leak the magnetic field out at the bottom. Here's our objective lens plane. Uh, for a gallium focused ion beam, we just put one of these Einzel lenses at the bottom of the column and that becomes our objective lens plane. We talked about something called immersion mode in an SEM. This is what we do to go to high resolution imaging. Uh, we don't have anything similar to that with the Einzel lens. Uh, what I'll talk about next week with helium imaging is how we're able to actually get better resolution imaging than we can with an immersion lens using just a simple Einzel lens based on the, uh, the particulars of the, what's called the gas field ion source uh, GFIS system on that microscope. So here we'll talk about the source in the column. So the way that you get a gallium focused ion beam is you have a little packet of gallium which is solid at room temperature and will melt slightly above room temperature. And what we will do is run a little bit of current through it and it will it'll, uh, melt the gallium and then wet the tungsten needle like this. Uh, so you run that current, you get the wetting onto the needle and then you apply an extraction uh, voltage here. So you are able to extract ions from this wetted uh, needle and you form what's called a Taylor cone. So here's 
what the Taylor cone looks like. This is what we can say is our virtual source, something on the order of tens of nanometers. And uh, so you have your extraction electrode. You also have a suppressor. So these two things kind of work in concert. And the idea is that we want to have two microamps of emission uh, at any given time. And so over the lifetime of once we, once we melt this, we get a certain finite amount of gallium. Over the course of several days, as, you, as that gallium emits from the tip, we have to change our suppressor and extractor to keep two microamps. Uh, but that's the whole idea. Once we run out of gallium, then we have to melt again, and then we start the process again. So it's about a four-day process uh, where we have to restart the, the source. And here's our column. So again, we have our source at the top with the, ex the suppressor and extractor. We'll have a beam acceptance aperture that, that blocks a lot of that two microamps of current. And then the beam enters the condenser lens. And uh, we'll, we can change, I'll show later how we can change how that uh, beam is spread over the aperture here. But when we change current, we're mostly changing the beam selection aperture, just the size of the aperture or the hole that the beam passes through. Uh, and then that comes down through the scanning and stigmata octopoles. And these are responsible for both scanning the beam over the surface and also for changing the, the profile of the beam. So if, it's, if we have a stigmatism, we'll have an elliptically shaped beam. We want to get a round beam so that we can get uh, a nice small probe size. And then it passes through the objective lens where it gets focused down to a final point, and then, as I said, scanned across the sample. We can apply a voltage to this blanking plate and direct the beam onto an ammeter and use that to measure the current that we have in our beam. Uh, and as I said earlier, we can look at these op the optics of the three different types of microscopes, and really the only thing missing here are these steering optics in the gallium-focused ion beam system. OK, and this is true for electron beams and ion beams. The main parameters are the accelerating voltage, the probe current, and the probe convergence angle. And then these things come together to give us some probe diameter for our beam. And we can look at the, relative, or the relevant equations for the gallium-focused ion beam here and all the definitions here. So as we're doing our microscopy, we don't typically make a lot of these calculations, but it's good to know that these equations are here if we want to understand uh, why we're getting certain probe sizes and how they're related to aberrations in our system and these uh, main parameters, voltage, current, and convergence angle. So something that's very important when you're doing IMB microscopy is understanding the beam specimen interactions. So no matter what your IMB species is, you'll have something like this, where your incident ions will uh, make contact with the sample. You will sputter away atoms. That's often what you're looking to do when you want to uh, do direct etching of your material. You'll also create secondary electrons. These are going to go to the detector and will, will allow you to image uh, what you're irradiating with your beam. And then we'll also have ion implantation into the specimen. It will be uh, at a depth that's proportional to the energy of the ions. And you might have some amorphization of the material as a result of that implantation, some, some damage done to the material. Over here, we see that the, the sputter radius for gallium is quite large. It can be on the order of tens of nanometers. Uh, and that all depends on the probe size. But even for a nice small probe, like a five, seven nanometer probe is about the smallest you can do with gallium. You still might have a sputter radius that's on the order of tens of nanometers. Whereas for helium and neon, which we'll talk more about next week, that sputter radius is much smaller. So you'll get to do higher resolution patterning with the helium uh, beam and also the neon beam. And the sputter rate is very different. So if we say helium has a sputter rate of 1x, neon is about 30x, and gallium about 60x per unit current. And it's important to know that the current ranges that are available to us are also very different. So uh, gallium, we can operate as high as, say, 100 nanoamps, whereas helium and neon will only operate at about 100 picoamps at the highest. So when you combine the higher sputter rate and 
the higher current range, you get orders of magnitude larger volume removal using a gallium technique relative to these other techniques. In the SEM lecture, I spend time talking about interaction volume. So this is in silicon, 30 kV, 15, and 15, uh, and 5 kV. So uh, we have about 8 microns of penetration into silicon at 30 kV. When we have 30 kV with gallium, the stopping power to these ions is great, and you only will penetrate about 60 nanometers into silicon. So our, when we think about these beam specimen interactions, they're happening on very different uh, orders of magnitude in terms of the, the length scale. We can also look at the different ion species, helium, neon, and gallium. So for each one, if say we have 30 kV accelerating voltage, on average each ion will have 30 keV in energy. And we see for helium, the stopping power isn't as great, so we might get 500 nanometers in silicon, 150 for 30 kV neon, and then as I said, 60 for gallium. And we can simulate these, and, and this is how I came up with these, these diagrams. So the, the most common simulation that people use in the field is the SRIM simulation, stopping range of ions and matter. And you're able to pick your ion species, pick your energy, and show what the, what the scattering looks like in that specimen. It doesn't show an evolving surface, so it doesn't simulate the sputtering of atoms. Um, so you can't really simulate what it would be to make a via in your sample, for instance. But this is good to show you what your damage zone will be as a function of the energy and the ion species. And then there are other types of simulation software out there, uh, Invision and Ionize. So these are things that are um, being developed more in academia. And the, the SRIM simulation is kind of what's the freeware that's available to you online. Okay, so we can look at the chamber configuration in cartoon form. And on our systems, our eucentric height uh, is about five millimeters, and different microscopes have different eucentric height. But the whole idea with eucentric height is it's the place in the chamber where you can look at the same part of your specimen at any tilt. So if I tilt this to 52 degrees, I'm hitting the same point on my specimen. So I can go back and forth and see that's what the definition of eucentric height is. And it's important to be at eucentric height because ultimately what we want to do is we want to be able to image with the SEM what we're cutting with the gallium ion beam. So we need to have a coincident point for these two beams in the column and we design that coincident point where they cross to also be eucentric height so that we can do focused ion beam work at any tilt angle and also be able to see it. two main parameters that you're going to pay attention to with your, your FIB work are the voltage and the current. So the, the voltage controls the energy of the ions, as we've talked about, and the current controls the amount of ions incident to your specimen. Uh, and so we've already gone through the way the interaction volume changes as a function of voltage. It's important to note that at higher voltage, we can get a smaller probe size. Uh, and so the highest resolution milling you'll do will typically be at the highest voltage. So most of the time, our users are at 30 kV, which is the highest our systems go to. Uh, but there are, if you wanted to limit the damage zone, and that was most important to you, not the resolution, you can always go to a smaller voltage, therefore have smaller penetration depth into the sample. Uh, for current, the main thing you're balancing is the the resolution and the material removal rate. So at low currents, you can get really great resolution, but your material removal rate will be low, uh, and you might take a long time if you want to get really good patterns um, over a large area. So you can go to a higher current where you'll just sacrifice some resolution uh, for the speed that it would take to, to do your patterns. And you can see how the probe size grows as a function of current, and that's gonna give us, uh, say, less well-defined patterns at, at high current. We have a, a little plot here. You can see how the, the probe diameter changes as a function of the beam current for different voltages. So the, the smallest 
beam diameter is always going to be at the 30 kV accelerating voltage. And you can see at 5 kV, the diameter grows much quicker as we increase current. Uh, these are some tests I did a while ago where I tried to cut a 5 by 5 micron square, 1 micron deep at 1 nanoamp of current with a dwell time of 1 microsecond. So at each point that the beam hit, it stayed there for 1 microsecond. Uh, the way that it does that is it exposes the, the rectangle, uh, and, then it, and then it continues to expose it time and time again. So you basically proceed one layer after the other. And each time you expose, you're probably only removing a couple angstroms of material, depending on what your current is in your settings. So it might take thousands of passes to get to a depth of even, say, one micron. Uh, now, when I did this, on our systems, we saw even though I told it to go one micron deep for all of these patterns, the actual depth got more shallow as I lowered the voltage. So our old system's not very great at, at, try, at calculating the amount of time that it would take to go to a certain depth. The material removal rate gets lower as we lower the voltage in this energy range. And so when you, that's just something to keep in mind when you're doing your work. Uh, there is a nice calculator. This is on uh, Arizona State's. Uh, website where they allow you to put in your, your projectile ion, your material, your energy, your current, and it can calculate um, basically how long it would take you to remove a certain amount of volume. So you can use that to supplement the software that we have on our systems. So I mentioned earlier that the two main ways that we control the current in the system. The primary way is just by adjusting the size of the aperture here in the column. So uh, the larger the aperture, the more current that will allow through. It's quite simple. Uh, and this is really all that you'll be doing on a gallium fib column. Uh, there's another way where we can adjust the condenser lens. And this is usually something the engineers will do when they're making adjustments. But it is something that on our helium neon gallium system, you can change yourself to really dial in a current to an exact value. So the way that it works is whatever your, your voltage is on your Einzel lens will control how the beam is spread above the aperture. So if we have a less positive voltage, we'll allow our beam to spread more widely as it hits the aperture, and therefore you'll get, you'll get less current passing through that aperture. And then if we continue to have a less positive voltage, you can spread it more and, and again, get less current down to your sample. So by tweaking this condenser lens voltage, we can manipulate the current to our specimen uh, on the order of single picoamps, for example. All right, for alignments, you have uh, handouts that I've given you. So all these gallium concepts are on one side. You also have a handout for alignments. And these are all applicable to both SEM and to, to FIB. So we talked in SEM about first you want to adjust the source tilt and then use focus to tell you if you have astigmatism, to tell you if you have a lens alignment problem. Um, so there are analogies that we can draw to gallium fib. We don't have to do a source tilt adjustment, at least with gallium. We'll have a similar adjustment for helium and neon. Uh, but the focus and astigmatism and lens alignment work effectively the same way. Uh, the one difference is that we don't really steer the beam to center it on the objective lens. We rather move the aperture to eliminate any shifting of the image uh, that we might have while we change the focus. So uh, these are visual cues that I like to tell people about when they're making their adjustments. Here's the part for the gallium fib and how it's different from the SEM. When we're trying to understand the problems that we have with our beam, usually the astigmatism is the main culprit. And so in any of these uh, beams, ion or electron, we are prone to having an elliptically shaped beam that then induces what are sort of like stretched looking features on your sample. So if you have astigmatism, you, your focal plane will always have, a, or at the focus point, your beam profile is always circular. But above it, it would be elliptical. And then below it, it would be elliptical rotated 90 degrees. So what we do with the, the stigmata octopole is we sort of form the, 
the uh, cross-section of the beam from elliptical to circular uh, above the focal plane so that at the focal plane itself it becomes a smaller circle. And I have an example here. So this was captured with an SEM, but it's the same concept for gallium fib. So I'll just show it here. Uh, if we focus to one side and we have astigmatism, we can, might get stretching along a direction. So what's happening is we're contacting the sample with an ellipse. And then when we scan an ellipse over a large 2D array, all the signal kind of gets stretched along the shape of that ellipse. And then if we focus back to the other side, we'll see that we can get it to flip the other way. So if we were contacting it before with this ellipse, and then our beam went through the plane of the screen, now we'd be contacting it with an ellipse that's rotated 90 degrees. And so as we scan that over two dimensions, we get features that are stretched the other way. So here we can go back and forth. And the way that you fix astigmatism is you settle in the middle at sort of an inflection point, and then you use the stigmata to uh, fix that elliptical shape of the beam and ultimately get to a much sharper image. So it works exactly the same with SEM and uh, with gallium fin. So now we'll talk about some applications for the gallium fib. I showed early on we had that example of using a bitmap to do some milling. So you can kind of think of this as maskless writing. So if you had a, a bitmap where you had three white squares and you, you run that on the system, you're just going to cut up three squares into your material. If you inverted those colors, you would mill away everything but your, your squares, which in this case are black. And if we vary the grayscale, then we will get variable milling as a function of that grayscale value. So on our systems, white gets a longer dose or a longer dwell time per pixel. And then the more uh, dark a pixel is, the, the less dwell time you'll get. So it's kind of if you had, say, a millisecond of dose defined, then you'll get a millisecond at perfectly white. And say, uh, um, if you have 256 shades of gray, halfway down there, you'd get 500 microseconds, et cetera. So when you when you do this, you can get 3D patterning. And if we actually do it on the system, you can see that you get some, some actual 3D patterning uh, on the silicon. And uh, one thing to keep in mind when you do this is what are, how many pixels do you have in your image? Because the, our systems will want to hit every pixel in your bitmap with a beam shot. And so if you have a lot of pixels in a very small area, you're going to end up getting a large overlap. So for instance, if our beam size is 6 nanometers and uh, you have a lot of pixels here, then you might get 50% overlap, which is actually normally what we're looking for. 50% overlap is, tends to be the most efficient way to use something like gallium to mill a specimen. Um, if we then take that same bitmap and we just stretch it larger on our sample, then we're going to hit the same number of pixels and therefore the overlap won't be as great. So here now we have 0% overlap uh, with a say 4 by 4 versus 2 by 2 micron. And then if we keep stretching it still, we can get to negative overlap. And this will just have different uh, consequences for how your sample is milled. And actually in this particular case, I think the 3D milling proceeded a little bit better with negative overlapping. So this is a parameter that you can change if you're doing uh, this kind of grayscale bitmap milling. And then blowing them all up, you can see how, uh, how it, this is probably a little bit, has a nicer step ledge. But it's also a larger, uh, it's also a larger area, so it's something to consider. Uh, this is uh, a really nice example of doing direct device fabrication using uh, solely a gallium-focused ion beam. This comes from the Ferron group here at Caltech. And what they're making are these nanobeam resonators. This one's out of yttrium vanadate. Uh, and these are used for quantum uh, optics and quantum memory systems. Uh, but what they're doing is forming a beam at three different sizes. And you can see 
what that beam looks like in different profiles. So this is kind of what it looks like from above and from, or this is from above and from the side, and this is sort of a, a tilted view. But this takes a number of steps. You have to cut it from one angle on one side and a different angle on the other side. So you kind of undercut the beam. And then they go back and they pattern directly the, uh, at the, with this periodicity over the top of it. So this is, uh, takes a lot of work to, to put together this kind of a structure, but it's something that you can do reproducibly and, and effectively. Showed the gas injection system at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, this is what it looks like when that GIS needle gets inserted. It's only a couple hundred microns above the sample surface. And, and really, it's a couple hundred microns above eucentric height. So it's important to establish eucentric height because that's where the needle will insert. If your sample is too far away from eucentric height, the gas concentration won't be high enough to get the deposition or etching rates that you're looking for. And if it's too close, then the needle will crash into the sample. So we can do gas injection systems with, uh, with the gallium fib. So the ion beam compatible gases we have are platinum precursor, so we can deposit platinum. We can deposit tungsten. We can deposit silicon oxide uh, with a TAOS precursor. And we can do etching. So we, had, we saw the xenon difluoride enhances the etch of silicon and silicon oxide. We have what's called a delineation etch that uh, preferentially etches silicon oxide. And we have a selective carbon etch that helps to etch organic material. Uh, and it's basically a water vapor that gets uh, distributed over the sample surface and that helps to enhance etch rates at low currents to give you high resolution imaging uh, with small current beams. Oh, it, and a little faster material removal rate. We can also use these gas injection systems with the electron beam. So primarily we do this to de deposit material. So platinum, tungsten, silicon oxide will all get deposited uh, in the same way as with the gallium beam. And uh, we can also sometimes do etching. So people have reported with the xenon difluoride gas, by adding energy in the form of incident electrons, you can enhance the etch rate of of your material just with the xenon difluoride and, and the electrons. So this, we already showed this. I think it's probably not worth spending all the time. But now that we've talked about all these concepts, this comes back around to how we can deposit platinum. And, and in the next slides after this, I'll, I'll end up showing uh, a little bit of how this actually works, how we're going to do this, what's effectively chem chemical plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition of the metal. So I think uh, we saw making our, our Caltech logo. I'll just let it proceed for a moment here until you can see it. Okay. And then the xenon difluoride. So again, that's what the gas injection needle looks like. It's just a couple hundred microns above the sample surface. We saw that there's, therefore, directionality related to uh, the gas contacting the sample. And then I showed that, in this case, if you rotate it a couple times back and forth, you can get effectively a radially symmetric pillar. All right, another main application that people use gallium fib for is cutting cross sections. Uh, and so usually the first step to to cutting a cross section is depositing some protective metal on the surface. So this is where we use primarily platinum, but you can also use tungsten for this. And you might even do two steps. You might deposit first the first layer by the electron beam. And the reason for that is uh, if, we if we deposit with an ion beam, those first ions that come down, they're going to hit the sample, create secondary electrons. You'll get a local plasma, and that will help to take this precursor gas and, and allow it to deposit down as a, a metal. Uh, now, if you do that with the ion beam, it's more efficient because the ion beam is able to break apart the precursor gas on its way down to the sample. Uh, but you're going to embed some of that gallium into the sample when you do that. So if the top few nanometers of your material are most important to you, 
then you want to use a non-destructive beam to do the deposition. So in that case, you would use the electron beam to maybe deposit 100 or 200 nanometers. And then when you've finished that, you can bring in the ion beam to deposit however much else platinum that you, that you want. And so that, plat that gallium will get embedded into the platinum that was put down by the electron beam. Um, here, you can see what some of these pre precursor gases look like. And again, the idea is to bring the beam down, create secondary electrons, you get a local plasma, and that will help you with the plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition. Uh, when we do it with electrons, we want to in increase the number of secondary electrons here at the surface. So we want usually a low voltage that will give us a, give us more of our current will leave as signal. And then we can just increase the amount of current to boost the overall number of secondary electrons. Once you put this uh, platinum down and you cut, the effect is that you will get a smoother cross section. If you don't have any platinum or any metal down, you'll get what are called cur a curtaining effect. So any imperfections on the surface will get transferred down the face of the cross section and it won't reveal a nice smooth cross section for you. So that's the point of putting down the protective metal. And I'll show a couple examples in a moment. Um, when we do this with the ion beam, it's important to get the current density correct. Because if you have too much current in too small of an area, you will have net etching of the material rather than deposition. So you want to tune to the right current density. For platinum, um, Thermo Fisher says something like 2 to 6 picoamps per micron squared. We usually do about 10 picoamps per micron squared to get the maximum deposition rate. And then for tungsten, it's about an order of magnitude higher, say 70 to 100 picoamps per micron squared of area to get deposition. And this just shows that your deposition rate will increase to a point, and then it will fall off, and you'll get net etching. And this is what it looks like when we actually cut these patterns. So these are on your handouts. When we do a regular cross section, that's the first step to kind of scoop material out from in front of the, the face. And we will do pass by pass by pass, just like we did with the, the rectangle before. But this time, the passes get smaller as they get closer to the cross section face. And so in this way, you're able to effectively uh, mill half of a rectangular prism. So it will take about half the time that it would take to do a, a full rectangular prism. And then once we've removed that material, we come in with what's called the cleaning cross section. And this is where the beam goes down at each pixel along the line. And effectively, when it gets to the end of a line, so it will go like at each pixel across the face, you've effectively removed a plane of material. And so then once you remove one plane, you step to the next and the next and the next. And so you can remove, uh, say, five nanometers at a time. You just keep shaving planes off in until you create a nice cross-section uh, surface. Here's an example of a fairly large cross-section. This is what our trench looks like when we do that regular cross-section. Here I just have deposited silicon oxide on top of silicon and then platinum on top of that and cut through it. This is an example of maybe the smallest thing we've been able to image with the SEM after cutting a cross section. So this is a device from the Atwater group. Uh, I think these were some, there was gold and other metal materials, but what he really wanted to look at was this seven nanometer aluminum oxide layer that was put there by atomic layer deposition. And so we can see some contrast there. Uh, I think we, we did some imaging at different voltages with the SEM and we're able to convince ourselves that what we were seeing was real imaging contrast uh, based on the material, not just topographic contrast based, based on the relief of the, of the etch. Um, but if you tune your ion beam parameters appropriately to get really good resolution when you're cutting, and then you tune your electron beam parameters to get optimum imaging, you can see things on the order of 5, 10 nanometers in our systems. A nice trick, if you don't want to go through the time of 
depositing platinum or tungsten locally to then cut through something. If you just have a homogeneous sample and you want to cut through and see the layers, you can take a Sharpie marker and just trace over the surface of the sample. And that Sharpie marker is mostly carbon. And so when you let it dry out after a couple of minutes, let the organics volatize away, you're left with about three, 400 nanometers of amorphous carbon. So if we look at that, uh, here we see the amorphous carbon layer. I put ion beam deposited platinum on top just to show really how thick it is. And in this device, we had metal insulator, metal insulator, metal. And we were able to uh, go in and, and image that with the field of view that's maybe a little more than a micron. Uh, but here's your 400 nanometers of amorphous carbon from the Sharpie. And that allowed us to have a nice sharp interface between uh, the, the Sharpie marker and the, the metal layers. Uh, and in here, with the, the deposited platinum from the ion beam, you can see some of that texture, that sort of nanocrystalline texture. That's a great way to know that you have a, a well-focused electron beam image, if you can actually see that texture. And it's also showing you sort of the, the morphology of the material as it's being deposited. And we also get a pretty nice interface here between the platinum and the carbon. So there's all sorts of videos that we have on our YouTube channel that show you how to cut and image cross sections and do a number of other things with the gallium beam. So I'll direct you to those videos. Oops. Now, one of those the other one of those videos and I'll show in a second is how can we mill a non-conductive specimen. So if we are dumping positive charge onto our specimen and we have a non-conductive material, then we'll build up that charge and then the beam will start to deflect. So we want to balance that by, by simultaneously uh, uh, scanning the image or scanning the material with electrons. So I think it's easiest just to, to show this and I think I'll make sure I'm muted. Okay, so I can kind of narrate. We have a, a circle here. We're just gonna try to mill that into a glass uh, slide. And if I grab a frame, as I grab each frame, we see there's like a, a glowing of the image. So there's some charge being built up. These are charging artifacts. And if I run a pattern where I'm just uh, tracing the circle uh, with the beam, and then I try to image that with the ion beam, you see there's something like a, rather than a circle, it's more of a streak across the sample. And if we were to image it with the electron beam, we can see that streak is there as well. And so the idea is that you want to balance the charge. And so now if we take that same pattern and we run it while we're simultaneously running with the electron beam, we'll see that you're gonna be able to balance the charge and mill a circle. So there it is. Things kind of shifted a little bit, but you're getting a nice circular pattern. And the trick is you typically want one to two times the electron beam current that you have for ion beam current, and that tends to work pretty well. OK, and there's another one. In terms of sample preparation, I mentioned this in the last lecture. We use uh, oxygen and argon plasma cleaner to remove organics from the surface of your sample. That combats what we call the black box effect, where we can get organic material to, uh, to evolve from the material and then get chemically vapor deposited back on as a new thin film of carbon on the surface. That carbon doesn't give off as many secondary electrons, so it appears darker. And if you have a non-conductive specimen and you can afford to, you can coat it with something like a carbon evaporator. So just a few nanometers of carbon works both for imaging with the SEM and for making your sample conductive with, for use with the gallium focused ion beam. Uh, here's some other examples. This is a colleague of mine from grad school, and he was automating the beam so we can run some scripts so that we can automate the electron beam and the ion beam to do uh, different patterning steps for us. So, what he was doing here was using a 
fiducial mark on the top of what he wanted to be a pillar, and he was using the ion beam to cut a tangent to that pillar, and then he'd rotate the stage, locate the fiducial mark to align everything, and then cut another tangent. And so over the course of, a, of an evening, he cut something like 30 tangents and was left with a pillar that looked like this. Now, this is sort of macroscopic compared to a lot of what people do in the K&I, but these kinds of techniques uh, can be used for, for smaller scale. A lot of times in the K&I, people will kind of just pattern an annulus that gets progressively smaller to make these kinds of pillars. Uh, but this kind of automation is something that you can use creatively for your own work. Here's another example of automation where someone wanted to cut holes in their material with different diameter and different pitch or spacing between them and wanted to mill thousands of these. So he did that overnight and wrote a program that would execute it. And so the scripting language is quite easy to learn and to utilize, so that's something that is available to you. Another thing that we can do in the lab is what's called slice and view. So if you want to reproduce, uh, say, the volume of your material so that you can look at it in MATLAB or some other software, then what you do is you kind of excavate uh, an area like this. So we have platinum on the surface and we've removed material from in front and the sides. We've put a fiducial mark here and then we can cut uh, a slice and then image it with the electron beam and then cut the next slice and image. And over the course of many, many slices, you're able to build up a, a series of images that can then get reconstructed into a volume. So, um, and in this case, we used, uh, this was a, another colleague of mine in grad school. She used uh, a backscattered electron detector to identify different phases in her material and then thresholded them in MATLAB. So she had a three phase material, pour, and then uh, uh, these two ceramic phases. And then when she put that all together, she was able to analyze this volume of material in MATLAB for things like volume fraction, tortuosity, triple phase boundaries. This was an example of this technique for something I worked on in grad school. This is aluminum oxide that was thermally grown and then there were some other oxide materials in it and by slicing and viewing we were able to image some inclusions that were in that material and then understand the, the shape of those inclusions. So this takes hours to do. This is about a thousand slices, so it's really something you want to do when you have a, a strong need for it, uh, but it's a nice technique that you can utilize. So we have this Omniprobe nano, nano manipulator. It's a tungsten needle, and so this is what the Omniprobe looks like when it's inserted uh, next to the platinum GIS needle. And this is 200 microns, so a fairly, fairly large field of view. What I often do in our lab is I'll sharpen the end of the probe so that we have about a one by one micron uh, rectangular prism that we can use. So it's nice and sharp. And I'll show what we do with it primarily is we create TEM lamella samples. So the idea is you want to use the gallium fib to remove material from in front of a lamella and remove material from behind it and then you cut what's called like a u-shape underneath and then the only thing that's connecting the lamella to the bulk of your sample is this bridge so before you cut the bridge you bring the probe down and you weld with platinum the probe to the lamella and then you cut free the bridge and now you have the lamella that's attached directly to the probe so here, we've cut free the bridge, and we're able to uh, show, as we then remove the lamella from the trench, we can control the probe on the order of uh, nanometers per second. So you can really manipulate it quite precisely and safely extract this thin piece of material from the bulk of your sample. We then would bring it over to 
say, a copper grid, and this is the copper. We bring it in close proximity. We weld it with platinum again, and then cut free the probe. And now you have your lamella attached to the grid. So here would be your, your thin foil lamella. Here's your grid, your platinum needle, and your omniprobe. And here are some examples of, of what we've been doing in our lab. So we can do this sort of side attach technique, as I have here, or we can attach to the top of one of these grid posts. And when we do that, we just first cut a little notch out with the gallium fib uh, so that when we go to thin it, the gallium isn't bouncing off copper that's in close proximity. You would get copper redepositing onto your sample. So you kind of leave this, this area so that you can get the paths of the, the gallium to, to go through and, and hit the copper far below. Um, the nice thing about the side attach technique is that you can practice. And if you screw up, you can, you can keep practicing and just do a little bit at a time. When you do it on the top, the nice thing is that you weld it in two positions. So it really locks into place. So you have better mechanical stability when you thin. And because uh, when it gets really thin, and we're talking about less than 100 nanometers, the, the lamella can start to twist and bend. So this really helps lock it into place so you can get a nice uh, even thinning across a larger area of your material. Uh, this is an example that I did in grad school on the same sample. I wanted both a cross section for TEM and also a surface section. And so in cross section, we did what I just showed. We do that U cut, we cut it free, lift it out, weld it. And then the bird's eye view with the gallium fib is we start to thin by patterning, cleaning cross section patterns on either side until we ultimately get down to, in this case, like a 50 nanometer thin lamella. And then for a surface section, you kind of cut uh, a, what they call like a chunk of material out and it looks like a wedge here. So you weld it to the grid, and then you're able to remove most of the material is going to be from the, the bulk of the specimen. And then you also remove the platinum that you deposited uh, when, you, when you protected it over in this step. And I think what I did, I was interested in getting this oxide phase in my lamella. So as I thinned it, I was using a backscatter detector to see the atomic number contrast. And as I cut, I was able to expose the a thin section of the oxide layer that I cared most about. And I'll mention that on YouTube, we have a whole uh, playlist for preparing TEM samples. I think it's a nine part playlist that takes, fr takes you from protecting your sample with platinum all the way to the very final thinning steps, which are often done with low voltage gallium fib so that the damage zone that you leave is very, very small. And that means you have maximum crystallinity in the sample, even if it's only 100 nanometers thin. Uh, here I'll just show we have TEMs in our lab where you can do the analysis of these thin lamella. So we have a 300 kV TEM that has a, a scanning mode stem. We have EDS. We have a high angle annular dark field detector. And then we also have a 200 kV TEM that has, uh, again, STEM, EDS, electron energy loss spectroscopy, yields, uh, energy filtered TEM. Uh, so you can go on our YouTube, or excuse me, on our wiki site, and you can read all about our TEMs and what you can do with them. These are some examples of projects that I've helped students with over the years. Here we just looked at quantum dots that are about five, seven nanometers and see the, the, the lattice images of those dots. This I showed some examples of metal insulator metal devices. Here we were studying grain boundaries and twin boundaries uh, in an aluminum layer. This is a quantum cascade laser where all those layers are, are deposited by molecular, molecular beam epitaxy, so as thin as one nanometer in, in thickness. And then we can do diffraction studies where we study the crystallinity of our materials, the lattice spacing, and, and all other types of uh, fun crystal uh, properties. So 
that about wraps us up. This is uh, just a precursor to next week where we'll talk about helium ion microscopy and neon ion microscopy. So the idea is for gallium fib, it's good for large areas and large volume removal. Um, but then if you want to do smaller volumes and you want better resolution, you want to use smaller probe sizes. So you can think of your helium, neon, and gallium as different drill bits, different size drill bits. So this would be your large bit, medium, and then small. And there's going to be different tasks that we want to employ these beams for. Um, and there will be different artifacts and different uh, considerations for the beam specimen interactions. But these are some, some devices that have been made with helium and neon from literature. So some, uh, these are some plasmonic devices where you can create antennae that have a really small gap between them, maybe just a four nanometer gap in this case. There have been split beam resonators that people make where they use helium to cut the, the split part of this sphere. And then you can do pretty high aspect ratio milling with, with neon as is done here, and I'll have an example of that uh, actually here on this slide. So these are examples from our lab where we do really high resolution imaging with helium. Uh, I'll, say, I'll tell you why we can do better with helium than we can do with electrons in, a, uh, in an SEM. We can use what's called an electron flood gun to balance the accumulating charge of a helium beam to image insulating devices that are even suspended like we have here. We have a gallium fib on that system, so we can cut a cross section and then image it with helium. This is a field of view that's, I think, only about 400, 500 nanometers, which is not something you would probably be able to do in an SEM. This is only 300 nanometer field of view, just for comparison. And then I'll show some other techniques that we've come up with where you can use these small beams to do uh, large area patterning. So rather than using them as direct etching beams, we'll use them as lithography beams. And this is a way to utilize that small probe size over a large material or, or, or large area and uh, do the kinds of device fabrication that our users need to do in our lab. Uh, here's. Uh, making graphene nanoribbons with a helium beam and some of these high aspect ratio cuts using neon. So I think that ends us, uh, ends our session. You have your handouts in front of you, which are uh, from last week, scanning electron microscope concepts, today's concepts for, for gallium focused ion beam, and then your alignments handout uh, that covers both SEM and gallium fib. So I think with that, I will pause here and take any questions that you have. Yeah, Anthony? Uh, I was curious about the flight and trees. So um, what kind of resonances can you get for instance with the uh, for each day? Yeah. So the, the smallest probe size we can make is about five, seven nanometers. So the, the best resolution you're going to get on a slice is probably on the order of tens of nanometers. We can't really pattern anything. Even if you're just going to pattern, say, the smallest dot that you want to make through a membrane, it's going to be close to 20, 20 plus nanometers. So that's really also going to be about the resolution that you get. Um, but the nice thing is when you cut in a cleaning cross section, you're only interacting basically half of the interaction volume. So you, you are able to polish in a way that's a little more gentle than you could otherwise. Um, when you make a TEM sample and you do these cleaning cross sections, you're able to kind of endpoint it on on the scale of tens of nanometers. Um, so technically, you can do even better than what I just said. That's 20, but that's um, for for the slice in view. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess you can do better. You could probably do five, ten nanometers if you're gentle with your polishing step. Can you explain a little bit more about the lithography? The lithography? Yeah. For, the, for helium, the that'll be the next, next. Yeah, so we've. I'll show how we've demonstrated uh, five nanometer lithography with a helium ion beam, and etched that. So not just lithography, we can transfer the pattern via etch into silicon and tungsten. I'll show that, um, and I'll show how we can do what I call uh, neon hard mask lithography. So where we use 
uh, atomic layer deposition as your hard mask. So just a few nanometers of, say, aluminum oxide. And then you can cut uh, with the neon beam. You can just break through that ALD and then do a reactive ion etch to transfer the pattern. So you can end up making, this is a coil. We made a four millimeter long wire uh, in a 20 by 20 micron area uh, by having basically like a 30 nanometer gap that we just had a continuous spiral of. And what would take you about 20 hours to do it through direct etch with neon took about 25 minutes to do the lithography and then the etch the reactive ion etch step was about 40 seconds. So uh, I'll show more about that next week. And, and I think that's the exciting thing for our lab is we're really a lithography lab, and people need to do large area patterning. And so when we have these, these beams, we want to make sure we can utilize them in ways that are, uh, that are best for our users. And so we've tried to turn helium and neon, especially into lithography beams for that purpose. But yeah, I'll be happy to talk more about that next week.